thank you, Lord Jesus, for your mercy and your grace. And Father, we commit everything that we're about to say and do into your hands, and we ask you to have your way. Move as you will, do as you please, touch, change, transform every life. When all is said and done, let the glory be to you alone, for in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said amen. All right, please, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 1, and I'm going to continue in the series following God's excellence. When we kicked off, we started at a place of knowing the will of God, because the excellence of God is revealed in what God wants to happen. It's revealed in the plan of God and in the purpose of God for our lives. We looked at the story of Gideon, how that Gideon was going to go to war with 32,000 people. And to be honest, even the 32,000 did not seem enough to go against the army that Gideon wanted to fight. But at least with 32,000 people, you have a sense of confidence that you can take the army or the enemy on. But then God told him the 32,000 are too many, send 10,000 home, and he was left to 22,000. And God said the 22,000 people are still too many. I want to deliver you. And I don't want anyone to say that it's because of our numbers that we were delivered. And so God whittled down that number to a mere 300 men. And God gave them the victory with 300 men. And we talked about all the challenges that Gideon would have had to go through as a person to whittle down 32,000 to 300 people. The number of people who have been upset that they were not chosen to fight in this battle that could have made them famous, that could have given them uh, stories to tell and songs that may be sung about them. You know, in those days, they liked to go to wars and people would sing songs about people's accomplishments. But Gideon had to wrestle with that challenge and send those people home so that the 300 people that God chose could go to battle with the Midianites and with the Amalekites. And God gave them the victory indeed. Hallelujah. And it was not just a victory for the 300. It was a victory for everyone. Last week, we looked at the love of God. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, I will show you a more excellent way. And he began to talk to us about the love of God. The love of God is God's excellence in action. The love of God is, you know, um, the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God and the grace of God all enveloped into a theme. And when we follow the love of God, we follow God's excellence. You look at the scriptures, and many places in the scriptures, it encourages the believer, the Christian, to walk in love. Somebody say, walk in love. Because by walking in love, we walk in the excellence of God. And today I want us to talk about excellence, and God's excellence in action, and how that we are meant to be excellent people, operating in excellence. Genesis chapter 1, are you there now? In Genesis chapter 1, God was creating, we see the creation of the world in Genesis chapter 1. Amazing work that God did. And the Bible says on the first day, you know, God created the lights. We don't have time to go through all the scriptures. But every time that God created something, the first day, the Bible says God saw that it was good. The second day, God made certain more things. The Bible says God saw that it was good. On the third day, he made more things. God saw that it was good. God kept adding. God kept adding. God kept adding. Hallelujah. Day after day, and the Bible kept confirming, and the Lord saw that it was good. Verse 10, the Lord saw that it was good. The Bible says in verse 12, and God saw that it was good. The Bible keeps going. It takes us to verse 18, and God saw that it was good. And then the Bible goes all the way to verse 26 and talks about the creation of man. All right? Oh, no, verse 21, and God saw that it was good. And then verse 26, God makes man in his image and in his likeness. Oh, no, first he creates the cattle, verse 25, and God saw that it was good. And then in 26, God makes man. And having made man, the Bible tells us that God rested, you know, looked at all. First of all, verse 31, God looked at everything that he had made. Everything. Somebody say everything. He inspected everything. God cross-checked everything. In the New King James Version, it says, Then God saw everything that he had made, verse 31, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Everything that he had made. I want us to go to the classic amplified version of the Bible and read this. 
It says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was suitable, it was pleasant, and he approved it completely. And there was evening and there was morning a sixth day. He approved it completely. Every time, you know, it's like God came to this place of creation with a picture in mind, with an image in mind. There was something on the inside of him that he was trying to create on the outside of him. And so when God spoke the lights into creation, lights to manage the day and lights to manage the night, the Bible says he saw that it was good. How did he confirm that it was good? It's because there was something that God wanted to see happen in, in relation to light. And what manifested was in line with God. God was expecting. So God said, this is good. When God, wanted to, when God separated the waters from the earth so that the seas and the oceans were created and the land was created, the Bible says he saw that it was good. When God created the sea creatures... Uh, when he created the animals and the things that creep, the beds of the air, the Bible says that every one of these points in time, God saw that it was good. And when God made man in his image and in his likeness, God said, everything that I have made, everything fits well together. The ecosystems work well together. The, the chains that we were taught in biology or we were taught in geography, the topography of the earth, the way the, the oceans do not go past their boundaries, how the way that trees bring forth seed according to their kind and bear fruit according to their kind. God looked at everything and God said everything was good. God pictured the whole works of his creation and said, no, this is exactly the way I want it to be. There was something he was walking towards, something he was going for. And he wasn't satisfied to create anything and say, we'll just leave it like that. It's okay. Don't worry. Nobody's going to see it. Let's just leave it the way it is. No. Everything that God made, God confirmed it was good. That is the way God works. That is the way God operates. That is the way God does things. He looks at things and he says, it is good. Somebody say, it is good. <laughs> it is good. The ways of God are good. The things that God does is good. Every work of God is good. Everything that God begins is good. In fact, the Bible says God is a good God. Can you go with me to James chapter 1? Not only is God a good God, he does good things. Go with me to James chapter 1. Look at this. Verse 17, every, let's read from verse 16. It says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. You know, there was a time when they said God is a good God and people were taking offense to that statement that God is a good God. But God is a good God. Everything that God does is good. In fact, there are times in our lives where we are not clear about what is even happening and we are trusting in God. We are praying for a miracle, trusting God for a breakthrough. We don't understand why things are taking so long or they have turned in the way that they have, but we are trusting that God is going to make things work out for our good. And you know what? The Bible says that as many of us that put our trust in the Lord, we shall not be put to shame. Where we struggle is having faith until we see the results because we are lacking patience. And the Bible says that we should be like those who through faith and patience, that is having faith until you see the results. We should follow them who through faith and patience receive the results. But God is always doing good. God is always working excellently in our lives. In fact, I was saying to the workers this morning, if you get your Bible up and you search for the word excellent, you will see throughout the scriptures where they describe God as excellent, where they describe the works of God as excellent. So we can trust that if God says, I am working something out on your behalf, that the end goal is excellence. 
The end result is excellence. Jesus was walking the face of the earth. And the time he said to them, he said, look, my father is always working. And even now he's still working. He said he has been working from the beginning. He's working even now. And the son is copying what the father is doing. The father is working and the son is working. And the son is doing what the father is doing. And as children of God, our works, the quality of our works, the standard of our works should not be below the standard of God. If God is an excellent God and God gives birth to excellent children, can somebody say amen to that? God had an attitude about the things that he was creating in the beginning. He was checking it out. He was inspecting it. He was approving it. If you go to the factories where they are producing lots of, you know, content for us to use in the world, there's a department that manages quality control. My daughter likes to watch all these people cooking stuff, so they were watching this cooking program. And then this lady said, you know, oh, we're using uh, beans, baked beans in one of our recipes, so let's go to the factory and see how they make baked beans. And there were these two ladies who have been working there for over 20 years. They met their husbands there. Their husbands also work at the factory. <laughs> and their job, the job, at least I don't know how long they've been doing this job, but they've been working there for over 20 years, is to eat baked beans from different cans to ensure the consistency of taste in all the cans that they have opened. So they open the baked beans and they pour it into different plates. Plates are all over this massive table. And then they're just going, pam, pam. Pam, I was like, how do they manage their weight? They're just eating beans nonstop every day. Praise God, baked beans. Every day, bam, bam, they're just eating beans, eating beans. And if you have been eating the same baked beans for many years, if one of them doesn't taste right, you will know. Praise God. How many of you have ever put something in your mouth and you felt like, nah, something is not right with this. Something is wrong. It looks fine on the outside, but when you beat on it, you're like, no, something is wrong on the inside. Now, if you are very hungry, just be like, in Jesus' name, amen, swallow. <laughs> well, if you have a choice, you will remove it from your mouth and say, no, we don't want to eat something that will cause us problems tomorrow or the day after. So quality control is so important in everything that we do. These people spend time eating the big beans to ensure that the quality of the big beans is right before it goes out into the market. People would open the crisps to check the quality of the crisps to make sure that no burnt crisps made it to the customer. And sometimes they do, and they have to call it back. They have to call it back. You say, ah, what are the chances that somebody's going to eat the one that is bad? We don't want to know. We we'll just call everything back. Why? Quality control. Quality control allows you to approve the things that you are producing before it gets into the market. I want you to understand this, that God applied quality control to creation. If you have no goal, if you have no vision, if you have no dream, if you have no blueprint, you will not know when you have arrived or when you have accomplished what it is that you are trying to accomplish. If there's nothing you are trying to achieve, you, there's no way you're going to achieve it. Imagine a coach just saying to a football team in the premiership, or is it premiership or premier league, amen? Any of the two, Amen. Just go there and have fun. It's not like they've won, no, and this is just a game for them to play. No, they haven't even won. They, they need to win. And the coach says, just go there and have fun. No, they don't tell them to go there and have fun. <laughs> they tell them to go there and win. And sometimes the number of scores they have against the other team matters. So there's always a goal, something they are trying to achieve. What I'm trying to emphasize to you is that when God was creating the world, God had something he was trying to achieve and that's why the Bible tells us that on the final day, God looked at everything he had made and he approved it. God approved it. God approved it. God had a blueprint. He was working to achieve something. Come on, let me ask you, what are you working to achieve? What is it that you are aiming for? In the workplace, what are you aiming for? As a student, what are you aiming for? What do you want to graduate university with? What kind of grades do you want to have? What do you want your testimony to be in the workplace? 
What do you want your testimony to be in your community? What do you want the testimony to be in church? Because we have a God who is excellent. We have a God who approaches things excellently. I said to someone this morning before service, I said, God has restored you. <laughs> you know, when God blesses you, you might think that ah, this is even enough. Well, God is like, ah, no, I've not finished what I want to do in your life. You think that I've, what I've done for you is okay. And I'm like, no, I'm just starting. I've not finished. Praise God. <laughs> Come on, say this to me. Lord, finish what you have started in my life. It's so important that we allow God to finish what God wants to do in our lives. We allow God to finish what God wants to do in our lives. You know, I was believing God for financial increase. And then my boss was like, oh yeah, I'm going to go to the rewards panel. And I'm going to ask them, you know, to multiply your salary, or increase your salary by several points. And I was like, oh, that's great. And then she went away and she got it. And I was like, wow, praise God. And then just before they implemented the reward, my salary, she resigned and said, look, I'm resigning and I've recommended that uh, they push you up to cover the role, you know, until they replace the role. And so just as before they were about to increase my salary, they decided to give me another significant increase in salary. See, the initial increase they had given me had already made my life softer. Praise God. That increase was going to make my life softer than it was. But then God was like, I'm not finished with you. You think your life is going to be soft? I want to make your life even softer than you have already expected it to be. Even softer. Praise God. We can do it soft life. Amen. Soft life is good. God bless you, man. Soft life is good. Especially when you are following the plan and the purpose of God for your life. So as the children of God, listen to me, as God's children, when we follow and we serve a God who thinks excellence, then we pursue, we follow after, and we demonstrate excellence in everything that we do. And everywhere that we go. Can you follow me to Daniel chapter 6? In Daniel chapter 6, the Bible says it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors of whom Daniel was one, and the satraps, that the satraps might give account to them. So that the king would suffer no loss. So listen to this everyone. The king set 120 satraps over the whole kingdom and put three governors over the 120 so that he would not lose anything. Right? His goal was accountability and that he would suffer no loss. I don't want anyone to steal my stuff. I don't want anyone to be corrupt and to pocket the things that I want them to do in this nation. So not only have I set 120 satraps or counselors in the nation, these governors are going to manage these counselors to make sure that I am not out of pocket or that the people do not suffer any loss. The Bible says in verse 3, Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps, not just the governors now, not just the other two governors, but even all the other satraps that were working with Daniel and working with the others, they sought to find some charge against Daniel. So the impression here is that one out of the 123, 122 people were looking for a way to catch Daniel out. Right? They sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge at all or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then this man said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. 
And so they set up some scheme to catch Daniel in relation to his faith. You see, Daniel's job was to make sure the king did not suffer loss. You see, what was happening in this space at this time was that the satraps and the governors had found a way to cover up all the misactions that they were doing. They were stealing items, stealing property, stealing money, cheating people out, and they were covering it up. But the satraps who reported to Daniel, they couldn't get away with it. People have come to bribe Daniel so that he will allow them to pass those things through. And Daniel said, no, I'm not taking that. Catch this person and put him in prison. The other governors were frustrated because Daniel wasn't playing ball with what they were scheming. Daniel wasn't playing ball. The goal of the assignment that was given to Daniel, the governors, the satrap, is that the king will not suffer any loss. But the Bible says, Daniel distinguished himself. Listen to me, everyone. You know, sometimes in the workplace, we, we have this sense that we are being cheated. That, and, and sometimes it might be that, you know, there's nepotism in the workplace or people are being, you know, unfairly treated more favorably than others. But for the most part, people distinguish themselves. People distinguish themselves. <laughs> when somebody else is saying, look, I just need to do 100 and I've done my job and I can go home. Some people are thinking I'm going to do 120. Not because they asked me to do 120. But that is the kind of person that I am. I go the extra mile. I go the second mile. I go above and beyond for my employer, for my business. People go the extra mile. They are not slacking. There's sometimes, that I, there's sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm working. And some of my team members, it's not even 4 o'clock when they close. 3.55, they're already on the staircase on the way out. They want 4 o'clock to meet them at the door. I said, it's not like that. 4 o'clock doesn't meet you at the door. That as long as you are in the building, when your time is up, you can head out the door. No. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. And then some other people are staying back to finish up some work before they go and then that get, person gets promoted and you say, oh, it's because they are this or that or they are friends with the boss. That's why they got promoted. Sometimes that can happen. But a lot of times, people are looking for those little, little things that people are doing that nobody else does. And sometimes we can get all, you know, racially inclined. You know, October, Black History Month, yes, I've been suffering and suffering and suffering. But if you reflect on your own work and the level of your performance, sometimes we realize that we are below average and God does not want you to be below average. God does not want you to even be average. God is not average. Somebody say God is not average. God doesn't do average. God does, even when he wants to answer our prayers, Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, far above all that you ask, or dare to think or imagine, according to the power that works in you. God doesn't do average. God doesn't do below par. No, he's always going above and beyond. Hallelujah. Daniel distinguished himself. You know, if we're going to follow God's excellence, we need to distinguish ourselves. We need to distinguish ourselves. In your community, distinguish yourself. Be known as a person of integrity. If you say you are going to do something, you deliver it. You don't say to shoot the people away or to get rid of them. This person is disturbing me. Let me tell them what they want to hear so that they will leave me alone. But you never had any intention of delivering on what it is that you promised. No, you can't. We don't do that. We don't do that. And, you know... One day, somebody joined uh, one company that I was working for, and the person came to see us in HR, <laughs> human resources. Honestly, this person has the boldness of a lion. <laughs> he came to us and he said, okay, so I understand that here we get 26 days holiday plus 10 days. The HR person was like, 10 days? What, what 10 days are you talking about? He said, ah, 10 days, we, sickness, 10 days. <laughs> So he had taken his 26 days of leave and added the 10 days of sickness to make 36 days of leave. 
When the 26 days are over, I will just say, I'm sick. <laughs> We're off to Mor- Morocco. <laughs> the guy was counting the 10 day sickness absence as annual leave days that he can use whenever he needs to take a day off. Somebody said, Pastor Emmy, we all do it. We don't, oh. We don't. Somebody say, we don't. We don't do that. We don't do that. We don't. Daniel, it was Daniel. Listen to me. When the Bible says Daniel distinguished himself, it means that Daniel took actions personally in the workplace that made him stand out from the crowd. Daniel was the migrant. Daniel was the slave who was asked to serve the king. But Daniel stood out from the crowd. From the 123, Daniel stood out. And the Bible says that Daniel stood out so much. Daniel's integrity was so loud that the king said, no, even though I wanted three governors, I will now make Daniel the boss of everybody, including the other two governors. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes we have all these career workshops and stuff. How do I progress in my career? How do I move forward? Stand out from the crowd. Stand out from the crowd. Go over and above. Be a solutions provider in the workplace. Be a solutions provider in the family. Don't be the person in the family who says it cannot happen, it cannot work, we are wasting our time. No, be that person who is committed 100%, 150% to see the results come to pass. Excellence begins with a deep and personal commitment. You cannot excel if you are not committed to excellence. It's personal. Somebody say it's personal. When you look at Daniel's life from Daniel chapter 1, you realize that it was not that they laid hands on Daniel and suddenly Daniel became a person that taught excellence. No, from Daniel chapter 1, Daniel was ensuing excellence. It's, it's when you say the Bible says Daniel had an excellent spirit. It's also talking about Daniel's attitude. Daniel's mentality. Hallelujah. Excellence. Somebody say excellence. That wherever you are, you are consistently constant. Somebody say consistent. Excellence requires consistency. Come on. If you are studying, you are wholly committed to excelling at your grades. If you are working, you are wholly committed to excelling at work. If you are involved in the work of the ministry, you are serving in church, you are wholly committed to your service in church. Some people have very poor attitudes to service in church. Because it's church. I'm like, no. <laughs> Listen to me, everyone. Let me tell you this story. The great artist, Michael Angelo, was painting the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel. Everybody knows about the painting on the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel. Has anybody here seen it? Anybody, put your hand if you've seen it. Well, it's on screen or in person. All right? We went there many, 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 it's a long time ago now. I might not even remember it, but if you Google it, you'll see it. All right? In the chapel, there are some corners in the chapel that you cannot see what is there. Michelangelo had spent a lot of time lying down on scaffolding and painting the ceiling, and on one particular occasion was painting in the corner of this ceiling and putting extricate details on the wings of small, small, small angels that, you know, fly around that cannot do anything. But he was painting in the corner. And one of his associates came to him and said, where are you? We're looking for him. They couldn't find him. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? The candles were everywhere. He said, oh, I'm over here. I'm walking. The person came to the place where looked up and thought, nobody is going to see what you are painting in this corner. Why are you spending so much time and energy painting this corner of the chapel, of the ceiling, that nobody is, nobody will ever see what you are painting? Michelangelo's response is that God sees it. No human being is going to see what he, he entered the corner to paint. But Michelangelo said, God sees it. You see, when someone is so committed to excellence, 
that you are not being excellent for other people. You are being excellent for yourself and for God because that is who you are or who you have become. Then your excellence will blow minds. Your excellence will scatter, you know, um, targets and goals you have set for yourself. Your excellence will scatter, you know, prizes people have achieved. So people are trying to be first. I want to be first. I want to be first. I want to be the first. I shall be the head and not the tail. Above all you are not beneath, but you are lazy as hell. Lazy people, you know, Minister Nicholas got us to pray a prayer. He said, the diligent will stand before kings. They will not stand before mere men. Let me say something to you this morning. Don't even aim to be the first. Aim to be the best. When there is nobody better than you, you don't need to say you are the first. People will come and acknowledge you as the first. Just aim to be the best. Are you part of a team in the workplace? Aim to be the best. Are you part of a community? Aim to be the best. Be committed to excellence. Are you involved in any job? Be the best at your job. People will come and they will find you out. 123 people, the king sought to make Daniel the ruler of all these people. Why? Because he was the best. Daniel wasn't trying to be the first. Daniel was just being himself, giving an excellent service. And the Bible says they came to a conclusion. Daniel did not go around saying, I have the spirit of excellence. Oh, are you still in church this morning? Can you see that? Look at it. Look at it. <laughs> Look at it. He says, then this Daniel distinguished himself above the godliness and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king did taught to set in him over the whole realm. He said, we must find a way to spoil his reputation. We must find a way to spoil his standing. He was a man of integrity, a righteous man, a just man, a clean man. They could not find anything in Daniel's life to pin him down. Nothing. Somebody say nothing. Daniel was blameless. Listen to me. Daniel is not a new creation. He, he, didn't, he has not received Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Daniel does not have the Holy Spirit living in him and the Bible says that these people were looking for something and they could not find something. You know, Jesus made a statement. He said that, uh, I think he said, the son of perdition is coming and he, and he, he will find nothing. He has nothing with me. When he comes, he will not find anything with me. A commitment to excellence. A devotion to excellence. And excellence requires work. Listen to me. And it, it requires consistency. Because if you do a good job here, and you go and do a bad job over there, when they are asking about you, people will say, one person will say, ah, don't give him your work to do. Another person will say, ah, you can give him your work to do. When people are speaking contrary like that, they'll say, this person is neither hot nor cold. Don't give him your work to do. No. Be consistent. Be consistent. You know, we're having a, a birthday celebration for me. One of my friends that I've known from 1998 was at that birthday celebration. And people were coming forward, people from high school, people from the community, they were coming forward to say one or two things about me. Not just church, praise God. It's like, I keep talking about people in the community and in the workplace, because sometimes when we get to church, we all behave like, we behave like sin. You know, we are sin, but you know, <laughs> you know in church, you, <laughs> you cannot hurt a fly. <laughs> but your neighbors, if we told them you are a Christian, they will curse. They will say, never, never, can never be a Christian, never. Why? Because when they are praying at night, they are saying, Lord, brother, so this brother that is next door, help us intervene in the affairs of this brother because this brother has caused us great harm. Praise the Lord. If you are still here, shout Hallelujah. You know, let me talk about small things. There are some small things that we do that are not nice. Are not nice because nobody's watching you. Excellence is who you are even if no one is watching you. Who you are when nobody's watching you. 
If you go to a public toilet and you use it, can somebody go and use it after you? Jesus is Lord. Pastor, is this, ah, is this Bible where? Yes. 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 If you live in a house with other people, maybe you're in a shared house, you're the last person to use the last row of tissue. And you know that there is no tissue left in the toilet. Maybe you are married, amen, or you are in a shared house, or maybe you are with family. You use the last one. It is empty. And you carry yourself, you wash and everything, and you just gallantly walked out smelling all nice. Ah, I've left this place. Listen to me, your excellence bar is low. It's low. That's excellence. Excellence. You are walking from home. Nobody is watching you. You take a break and watch, catch up on that series for two hours. Listen to me, everyone. When you have finished catching up on that series for two hours, make sure you return the two hours to your employer. Are you listening to me? If you don't return the two hours, you are a thief. You stole from your employer and you are not intending to return it. If you're a thief, shout hallelujah. Okay. I thought somebody would shout. <laughs> there are some people that don't listen to the message. They say, hallelujah. Ah, we can't the message that is not listening to the message. <laughs> Praise God. Somebody say, Pastor Amy is coming on strong today. Hey, praise God. Thank you, man. God bless you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The Bible says that Daniel was faithful. Listen to me. Faithfulness speaks of consistency. 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 You know, somebody was having a get-together at home. They said we should arrive for 7 o'clock. 6.50 something, I, knocked, I pressed the bell. The person told the people in the house, that is Pastor Emmy. They've not seen me. They've not, I didn't tell them. I just bring him, say, ah, Pastor Emmy is the one at the door. Yes. yes. Make excellence your brand. A good name is to be preferred to rubies. Yes. Make it your brand. They invited me to a wedding. I turned up at the time. People have been showing me in this country. I turned up before time. They said, ah, pastor, the time on the IV is not the time. It's one hour later. Please let me beg you. In the, <laughs> I beseech you in the name of the Lord. I cannot tell you how many times it has happened to me. Somebody invited us to a 40th party here for our husband. My wife, my whole family, we all dressed up fine. We got there before the time. They were arranging the venue. <laughs> it is severe disregard, disrespect, and dishonor to tell anybody to turn up at an event that you have no intention of starting at that time. We are the ones perpetuating poor attitudes, especially in our community. This person did not turn up to that birthday party till about two and a half. I said, look, whatever happens at this party, I am leaving at this time. Because I've caught, I have ah, my life. Do you know how much an hour of my life is worth? I said, I can't waste my life here. I just sat there, we just sat in the car. Thank God that it was, we didn't come with public transport in winter. Ah! ah, ah. I will be saying, God, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. Forgive them. Don't let them reap the harvest of this seed soon. I cannot tell you the number of times. So please, I beseech you by the message of God. I'm begging everybody now. They are recording it. If you are doing any event and you are inviting me, if your intention is to start three hours later, just tell me. I will come at the right time. I'm telling you. And if I, not, if I cannot make it at that time, I will tell you. You see, the pastors and ministers, we have a 9 a.m. meeting every Sunday morning. When I'm leaving my house Sunday morning, I know if I'm going to be at that meeting for 9 a.m. I'm the pastor. I will send them a message and say, I am going to be late. 
Sometimes I will even get here before them. But I will have sent them a message to say, I am going to be late for that 9 a.m. meeting. I have respect for them. I have respect for them. If I'm going to turn up it, I will tell you. It's only something that's happened. My phone has died. Sometimes I will tell my wife, please send a message. I'm driving. Send a message. This is, ex- this is excellence mindset. This is not Pastor Emil. You can't do it for me. No, the only one is that, ah, if you are doing an event, please, don't give me the wrong time. I'm begging everybody. I will have told my family, we can't be late. Everybody jump into the car. Hurry up, hurry up. Fru, fru. I will even, like, speed limit. Hey, we must get there on time. Why? Because Pastor Emi, no, Emmanuel Akinlaja, arise on time. That's my character. It doesn't matter whether or not you see me. It's my car. It's who I am. I arrive on time. Praise the Lord. That's who God is. God arrives on time. Some of us are thinking that God is late. God is not late. God arrives on time. You, know that you, haven't, you haven't checked his time. Somebody was believing God for something recently. And what they wanted to happen, the way they wanted it to happen was not happening. And they were, they were becoming upset with God. I said, look, you have prayed. You have fasted. I said, give thanks. And then sit down with God and say, God, what are you doing in this situation? Because if you know what God is doing, you will not be upset. If you know what God is doing, you will be, you'll be at ease inside. You will be fine. You will be okay. But because you don't know what God is doing, we're like, God is late. God is not late. If you are believing God to be married there, you will not marry the wrong person in Jesus' name. Because sometimes we want to help God. That This Eve that God is helping you to make, God is taking too long. Let me just marry a cow. Amen. It won't work. The Bible says that all these animals came in front of Adam and whatever he named them, that was their name. And Adam found no help meets. Am I right? Then you have to sleep. You have to rest. But you're not even looking. One fine person that is fine inside and outside will come. And then you'll be like, ah, thank God I waited. Thank God I waited. I was chasing somebody. My wife used to help me go and drop notes for the person. Praise God. So when I'm gisting with her, you know, you can't just go and say, let me go and drop notes for that girl. You first have to gist her. When you have finished gisting, you say, ah, by the way, let me drop this note. Amen. When that one did not even start, ah. And I said, Lord, okay, I faced the Lord for 12, six months. I said, I don't want to know anybody. I don't. When I said, okay, Lord, six months. Ah, oh yeah, where are we going? He said, ah, have you not seen my daughter came like, ah. You don't need to be going to the market. The market has come to you. I said, ah, I did even. There are some people that it's because their eye has not opened. That's why they have not seen. Just be praying that God, the person that you have ordained for me, let their eyes be open. Praise God. He said, we cannot find any charge against Daniel except in his God. We cannot find any charge against Daniel except according to his faith. Why? Because Daniel had an excellent spirit. It's an attitude, everybody. It's a way of thinking. It's your mentality that needs to change. And sometimes you can't change your spirit of excellence without exposing yourself to something that is excellent. Exposing yourself to something new, to something different. Change or challenge yourself to raise the bar of what you do in the workplace. Challenge yourself to raise the bar of what you do in your community. How you live your life in your community wherever you are. How you live your life with your family. How you live your life where you are resident. Challenge yourself to raise the bar with what you do in church. I don't like to give God less than what we would give God in the workplace. No. No. We need to give God better. We need to give God more. We need to have an excellent mindset. Anything that they've asked you to do in church, if you need to go and learn how to do it, go and learn how to do it and give God an excellent service. Commit yourself to doing better than what you did last week, what you did last year. Ask yourself, how can I improve on what I'm doing? Don't don't compare yourself to anybody because everybody is following their own journey. 
Compare yourself to yourself. Were you better with how you were serving God five years ago than what you are doing today? Challenge yourself to do better than five years ago. Challenge yourself to do better than ten years ago. Some people say, ah, when we were younger, ah, we were on fire for God. God has not changed. Why have you changed? You can still be on fire for God. You can be in the hospital all the time and still be on fire for God. You, you might have to travel all over the world to work, but you can still be on fire for God. You might be 100% remote and still be on fire for God. You might be renting and be on fire for God. Hallelujah. Whatever your state may be, whatever phase of life you may be, you can cultivate a spirit of excellence. And so I want you to talk to the Lord this morning and ask the Lord to teach you to cultivate a spirit of excellence. Teach you to cultivate a spirit of excellence in the workplace. What are the things that you need to change about your approach to work? What are the things that you need to change about your approach to service in the church of God? What are the things that you need to change with your approach to life in the community, at home, in that house where everybody else might be doing something that is wrong, you become the person that is doing something that is right. Why? Because of a spirit of excellence, an attitude, a way of thinking, a mentality that is inclined to excellence, inclined to a lifestyle of character and integrity. That whatever it is that you do, in word or in deed, you do all in the name of the Lord, with the help of the Lord, and to the glory of God. Come on, speak to the Lord today. Ask him to help you. Ask him to help you. Ask him to help you. And maybe you are here while others are praying. You are here. You are under the sound of my voice. Maybe watching or listening online. You have not yet made Jesus the Lord of your life. Or maybe you were committed to God at one time in the past. And up to now, you have been away from him. You've walked away from him. Maybe something happened in your life that caught you off from God. It's time for you to be restored back to God. Restored back to an excellent time of fellowship or relationship with God. I want to pray for you. And I want you to say these words after me first. And then I'm going to take time to pray. Just put your right hand on your chest if you want to receive Jesus into your life or you want to rededicate your life to him. Just take this time to pray and rededicate and consecrate yourself to the Lord once again. Like a prodigal son who's come back home, just say to the Lord, I've come back home. Forgive me of my sins. But I want you, if you want to receive Jesus into your life, to just say these few words with me. Say, dear Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice. I believe that you died for me and rose from the grave for my justification and my salvation. And I believe that you are Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for saving me and bringing me into your family. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice that there will be a stirring in their hearts and in their minds towards excellence, that they will live a life that reflects the God kind of nature that we have from you a life of excellence, a life of integrity, a life of character, a life that speaks volumes in the performance of their duties, responsibilities, and accountabilities, a life that is an example of the believer and for the believer. I pray that you will strengthen them through the power of the Holy Spirit and that grace will be multiplied to them to accomplish this in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. God is good. Glory to God. God is good. Hallelujah.